Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Michelle Yee from Emergency Medicine Cases, and this is part two of the rapid review of episode 77, Fever and the Returning Traveler. In part one of our review, we discussed the approach to the history and physical, and we reviewed typhoid and dengue fever. Now, in part two of this rapid review, we're going to be focusing on malaria, the clinical presentation, the diagnosis, the management. You might be surprised to learn that malaria is responsible for more morbidity and mortality worldwide than any other illness. So to start off, let's talk about the clinical presentation. The classic teaching around malaria is that there's a triad of fever, splenomegaly, and thrombocytopenia. But unfortunately, like many classic presentations, it's not very specific or sensitive. And besides fever, the presentation varies. Fever is seen in 90% of patients with malaria. It occurs as the malaria parasite replicates in the red blood cell and ruptures. Sometimes a cyclical response is seen where fever is triggered every two to three days, and other times it can be continuous. Malaria can have a short, intermediate, or long incubation period. The typical incubation period is about 8 to 25 days, but it can be even up to 12 months. So in almost any travel with fever, it's important to rule out malaria. Symptoms of malaria are often described as flu-like. Headache, cough, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, myalgias, and joint pain. These patients may have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea even without fever. So don't be fooled preemptively thinking it's traveler's diarrhea because they may have malaria. On the other hand, if your patient has jaundice and an elevated bilirubin, that's a pretty big clue that it might be severe malaria. Severe malaria is a medical emergency. These patients may have significant organ dysfunction. This may include shock, renal failure, or ARDS. They may have anemia a spontaneous bleeding, jaundice, or DIC. There may be electrolyte abnormalities or severe hypoglycemia, or cerebral malaria. This may present with impaired consciousness, recurrent seizures, and even coma. Once again, severe malaria is a medical emergency, so treat this aggressively. So how do we make the diagnosis? Malaria is diagnosed by thick and thin smears, but because parasitemia is cyclical, you need three negative smears taken 12 hours apart in order to rule out malaria. Parasite loads can help us stratify the severity of malaria, in which greater than 5%, we think severe malaria. Alternatively, if the smear comes back as Plasmodium falciparum, that's the most deadly strain, so consider immediate IV antimalarial medication. Recognized parasite levels may change over time, so patients with low or no parasite levels, they may still need empiric oral therapy and admission. As we mentioned before, never rely on a single smear to rule out malaria. Because of fluctuating levels, the first smear is negative in about 10% of patients. So now that we know how to recognize and diagnose malaria, let's get to the management. For treatment of severe malaria, the antimalarial options typically used include 1. Quinidine with doxycycline, or 2. Artesanate. In a Cochrane review, artesanate was shown to be superior to quinidine in reducing mortality of malaria. However, it's not available in all emergency departments, so you might be limited to whatever is available to you. Proceed with caution with IV quinidine because it can be cardiotoxic, so these patients should really be on cardiac monitors. While there are no clear guidelines on the disposition of these patients, for most adults and children with suspected malaria, consider hospital admi admission. Initial smears can be misleading, response to therapy is highly variable, and these patients can rapidly deteriorate. So let's wrap up with the seven most common pitfalls of malaria management. Number one, as emphasized in part one of this podcast, in every patient who presents with a fever, ask about travel. Number two, while the typical incubation period is 8 to 25 days, malaria can have an incubation period of up to 12 months, so the presentation, it can be delayed. Number three, patients with malaria may not have the typical cyclical fever, and sometimes they don't have fever at all. So just because a patient's afebrile 
Don't assume they don't have malaria. Number four, chemoprophylaxis. Unfortunately, it doesn't equal full protection. Compliance is often an issue, and even if it's good, it's not 100% protective. The classic triad of fever, splenomegaly, and thrombocytopenia, it's neither specific nor sensitive, so don't rely on it. Number six, if we haven't said it enough, do not rely on a single smear to rule out malaria. You need three negative smears completed every 12 hours to rule out malaria. Number seven, if you're worried about malaria, don't delay treatment while awaiting lab confirmation because things can rapidly progress. So thanks for tuning in for the rapid review of Fever and the Returning Traveler. For full references and a written summary, visit the Emergency Medicine Cases website.